if you look at what happened against or the, the, the genesis and the conclusion of the fees must fall, it's an interesting episode to study. And um, how it that it how it started, how it gained momentum and all those things, and how suddenly it died, and how some of its leaders received lucrative positions thereafter. Same modus operandi. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, we're talking with Faiki Mentor. Faiki is a South African politician who served as a member of the National Assembly from 2002 until 2014. She represented the African National Congress and served as the party's caucus chairperson between 2004 and 2008. She was chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises from 2009 to 2010. She is currently the Western Cape chairperson for Action SA. Faiki, thank you so much for making the time to join us. It's my pleasure. Faiki, um, I feel the intro I just gave you doesn't do your justice. So what would be your elevator pitch? What would you like to add to that intro? Um, I would say that I have been an active member of societies um, championing the rights of people since age 13. That's what many people do not know. And okay, so, so you were a member of parliament for quite a long period and you left somewhat before the EFF um, gained some seats in parliament. Do you feel like decorum has fallen somewhat in parliament. How does your years uh, reflect to the current, um, our, our conduct is being conducted in parliament today? Actually, it is um, horrifyingly upsetting, uh, the decorum in parliament since the arrival of the EFF. And actually when I was a mem uh, member of the National Assembly and um, caucus chair of the ANC, the first thing that I picked with them, the bone that I chewed with them was conduct and decorum in, in the House of Parliament. Um, I used to, if, if you can go to the archives, you'll realize that um, the ANC heckling was not happening under my administration as chair of caucus because I, I became horrifically shocked when I arrived in parliament as a member of parliament, uh, having been um, in the administration of government, arriving in parliament to find members of parliament behaving in that sort of manner. So it's actually unbecoming. Our parliament has lost its dignity. And not only that, they, have all, they are also dismally failing in performing their constitutional duties. And do you feel it's predominantly the EFF that has caused this reverse or is there some other parties that are also involved? So what is your opinion of the ANC, for example? I think the ANC is equally wrong. You know, most of the time, a tactic of disarming or inoculating um, wrong behavior, it's by ignoring it and not participating in it. So the ANC is not, it's not helping the, 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 the situation. And in some occasions, the EFF is legitimately frustrated, but that doesn't call for um, misbehavior. The one example that I would cite, and I wrote was whilst watching that, um, proceed, that proceedings, those proceedings, when the EFF was manhandled, physically abused out of the National Assembly because they were pushing for Jacob Zuma to go and they were chanting, bring back the money, bring back the money. That does not give anybody the right to, to manhandle a party simply because it is calling for the, the head of your leader. And I immediately wrote, go to the constitutional court 
and the EFF did that. And since the, the Constitutional Court, it was also about the issue of Zuma not wanting to establish the, 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 the Zondo Commission as we come to know it. So I'm, I'm saying it's, under, it's understandable to be frustrated. The ANC is often frustrating opposition deliberately, but then the opposition should not play into tactics of ANC by becoming unruly, to become frustrated to a point of affecting the decorum of the house. Hello, everyone. If you're interested in advertising on Worldview, drop us an email at worldview.help at gmail.com. We will send you an advertisement guide, which will include the rates and the process involved. A typical shout out for your company or project will be between 45 and 60 seconds. By advertising on our platform, you'll be supporting a company that wants to improve the public narrative. Once again, send us an email at worldview.help at gmail.com, which you can also find in the description below. Now, back to the interview. And what do you think practically we can do? What can be done about this? You know, there is a forum that is called um, a, a Chief Whips Forum, where all the parties meet, where they do um, planning and they do planning for sessions and all those things. All parties are represented there. This matter should be discussed there. That's point number one. If ever parliamentarians want to restore the dignity of parliament. However, I think as citizens also, we have a responsibility to play, to demand that um, the House of Parliament does not belong to the ANC nor to the EFF. It belongs to us South Africans and we demand that it shall be conducted under good decorum at all times and that it, it should fulfill its constitutional mandate as expected. I was invited by the uh, Speaker of Swedish Parliament when I think their parliamentary democracy was turning 200 years. And he hosted me, I was a chair of, of caucus then, he hosted a special dinner for me. In that dinner he expressed, and you must remember that Sweden is the ANC's historic friend, mm. the, the Scandinavian countries, and they supported us a lot and, and, uh, during apartheid in, in the struggle. They, the speaker was conveyed a message of dismay about, I mean, that's so many years, the, the, the Quran had not even deteriorated to the level it has deteriorated to. They raised it with me that um, we can do better in parliament. And they also said that the best way to, to curb misbehavior and to hold parliament accountable is to have a parliamentary ombudsman like uh, advanced democracies have. They have one. And the, to this effect, they gave me a letter, two letters, one to the Speaker of Parliament, who was Palekambete, two to um, President um, Tabumbeki, advising on three issues. One, the ombudsman to hold parliament accountable. Two, uh, um, they were complaining that the social distancing between the ANC and the electorate was increasing. Three, they were complaining about corruption. Already that ANC is not handling corruption as it should. And that was our friends. Nothing of those three um, issues have been corrected to date. In fact, they have been allowed to exacerbate. Very interesting. Um, so Faiki, I, I'd love to talk about the, the incident where you went to the Gupta's residents in Saxon world. But before that, did you get, get any idea that the wheels were sort of falling off? That before that incident, that the ANC, that there was something wrong with the ANC when President Zuma took over, that things were just falling apart? Of course. Um, remember at that time, the ANC was trying to put um, the Nkandla issue under the carpet. And I was vocal that time before it, before it even became public knowledge. I was vocal within the circle of the ANC and in parliament to say that the ANC must do justice, must deal with this matter urgently because it became exposed before a national election. 
and I said that we cannot go to elections with uh, such a scandal. We have to we have to to deal with it, even if it is the head of state, the sitting head of state that is doing so. So corruption did not uh, the ANC's recklessness does not only st start with the Guptas and protecting them. It started um, be, it started not even under the administration of, of Zuma only. Well, one can argue that there is corruption in every country, in every state. It only differs to, to degrees. Um, under Tabombeki, there were, I wouldn't say there was no corruption. Um, he, he also had a tendency of not dealing with um, historically people that that came from the ranks of the struggle, especially those that come from exile. Um, he, he, we, he believed in quietly speaking to people and we, we didn't even have a, a record that he actually does. So people be, began to, um, the culprits would do wrong over and over again and nothing would happen to them. It's just that under Zuma, this became extremely exacerbated, recklessly so. At least Mbeki um, held himself together as a head of state, behaved like, behaved like one. And corruption under him was not rampant. Um, I, I remember that um, I wrote to him as a head of state because there had been a mental hospital that was forever, the, the state was putting billions every year into it, but there was no foundation for that hospital. The same thing about a, 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 a prison and a police station. I wrote to Mbeki to say that for years, when you look at the, the allocation of the budget, there is money set aside for these ghosts, the ghost of a mental hospital that took 13 years to complete. Wow. And the, the one of the police station and prison uh, improvement. So I argued in my letter, I said, you know, Mr. Mbeki, the prisons are full in Kimberley in, in the Northern Cape, so much that prisoners get released, including hardcore ones, because the prisons are congested. And the money that was supposed to build a prison to, uh, to, to, to solve this problem has disappeared. Well, he did not respond to my letters, but he acted quietly. Very soon, the mental hospital was being erected as it should have been years ago, years before, and the prison and the police station. So at least he had a conscience. Um, much as he did not acknowledge the letter, within months of receiving it, I could see progress, unlike um, Mr. Zuma. So, Faiki, what happened on that infamous day when you were summoned to Saxon World uh, to the Gupta's residence, because I've heard that story and it's shocking, but I I'd love it if you can tell it to our audience what happened on that day. You know, um, I've said this to public protector Tulima Donzella, and I've said the same to um, the the now um, the the chairperson of um, the commission. I had been wanting to, to solve a particular problem that, that be, fell under public and enterprises. That problem was as soon as Zuma became president of the ANC and before he even became president of the state, during the time when Halima Motlante was a caretaker president. Just immediately after the ANC conference that elected Zuma, the PBMR, which is the Pebble Bed, the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor in Pelendam, was being put aside. And that we, we had a technological edge at that stage with that uh, project. Despite the fact that we had spent 8 billion rent at that time on the project. And we had sent our scientists to acquire knowledge from all over the world. We had best scientists. The other third thing is a similar project had been shut up or shut down in France and I think in Germany from a popular demand. 
but we continue with us. We learned lessons from the from the, Fre the French people and from the Germans. Then we carried ourselves, um, our project in, you know, within the reins of safety. We were producing already isotopes and nobody was producing those isotopes in the world. Isotopes that, that are, are very good for nuclear medicine and nuclear technology. That's how advanced the project was. But then just after the, the December conference, when parliament opens, there is an item on the portfolio of energy that um, proposes that um, the pebble bed modular reaction should be shot, shut down. At first, I thought they, they are dealing with the project that way because it was initiated, initiated under Mbeki's administration. I began to argue at caucus level and everywhere that we, you can't just get rid of a project, an important project, simply because it was formative under the person you now perceive to be an enemy. But it, it, it was not late. I learned later. Um, I spoke to both the board, Nexa, Chaperson, and the, the board and management of PBMR. They were uneasy. They didn't know what the future held for them and all those things. To that extent, um, during that time, Dipo Peters was the Minister of Energy. But then when Kalima was a, a caretaker president, I went to complain to him. I said, explain to me, why are we shutting this project? Is we have technological edge. And then I said to him, what's going to happen about that more than 200 um, rights, you know, um, intellectual property rights that are associated with the project? Where are they going to? because we were partnering with a, an American company, nuclear company in that project. I said, have you made mechanisms that neither the Americans nor anybody would run away with this intellectual property? So that should we decide in the future as a country to go back to the project, we will have our intellectual property protected and not owned by anyone or not sold to anyone. Kalema, I went to see him in the residential, presidential residence here in Cape Town. That day he was host, in the evening actually, he was hosting the first footballer, black South African footballer who went abroad, who is called Kalamazoo. And actually as he, he escorted him, he introduced me to him and my father and my uncle really loved Kalamazoo. That night I phoned them to say I shook his hand. Kalema simply said to me, go and speak to the Minister of Energy and go and speak to Jacob Zuma in Lutuli House. So I went back and I spoke to the Minister of Energy. She didn't have answers. She was the poor Peters. She also said, go and speak to the president of the ANC. So from the time when Zuma was still president of the ANC, before he became head of state, I was seeking to meet him regarding this project. And then that fateful day, on a Sunday evening, I got a call that after many letters and many efforts, now he was a head of state, he was, had been a, for a period a head of state, he wanted to see me according to the phone call. He wanted to heed the call to meet me. So I left here thinking I was going to Pretoria, to the union building, but it would not be the union building eventually. I would end up at Sahara, and at the Gupta's um, compound. Mm. And I was kept there the whole time. And Zuma came to meet me there. Instead of me meeting him in an official building of government, which is the union building. I would have understood if I was meeting him in the presidential residence, like Matlamban Lov, just like I met Kalema in the presidential um residence here, but it was a, a shocking moment. Mm. It was in a private property of other people. So that's the long and short of it. And in that moment, uh, the Guptas offered you the job of Minister of Public Enterprises, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yes, they said that there was an eminent cabinet reshuffle and that um, I could replace Barbara Hogan as Minister of Public, Public Enterprises if I promised to, to get rid of the SAA OR Tambo um, India route. So I did not agree to that and I did not become a minister and I don't have a problem with it because I, I followed my conscience. And after the fact, President Zuma approached you and sort of tried to make you reconsider that offer. I mean, when, when the Guptas made you that offer, President Zuma into the room and tried to make you while you're walking to the car, if I'm not mistaken, to reconsider that No, no, that no, you got, you got it wrong. I was not yet walking to the car. I was just loud. I was getting, I was losing my cool because I was asking this guy, but who do you think you are? Um, and then I said, I, I first, you know, I first said to him, how are you able to make me a minister? Because only the president can do that. And then his exact word where we often do it. We often put a word in for people to be appointed and suggesting that whenever they said so, Zuma would heed the uh, decision as to who should be given which particular portfolio of interest. So um, we, we spoke about other things uh, that, and th those have been ignored actually. Um, they also wanted denial in that meeting. Um, as I told um, Judge Zondo, they had knowledge to a top secret matter they should not have had knowledge of. That because I sat on the portfolio of um, the Standing Committee of Intelligence, that's how I knew about the top secret. They said that they could, there was a problem between South Africa and India, which I would not divulge. But then they knew about it. And that really, that's when really I lost my cool. I realized the depth of their interference and power in the administration of Zuma. So as, as I raised my voice, getting angry, Zuma stepped in from another direction of the house, not from the one where I had entered. And a week later, you found that Barbara Hogan, who I believe was the Minister of Public Enterprises at that time, was either she left the position or she was fired and she was replaced by Gigaba. And you, and you said that just sent a cold shiver down your spine. These people are serious. Yes, uh, I, I'm not very sure that it was exactly after a week, but it did happen. And actually I was driving from the airport and my radio was on, on in the car when I heard that Barbara Hogan and three other ministers have been chopped from the cabinet. And as you say, there was some cold sweat that ran down my spine to realize, realizing how deeply in nonsense we are as we were as a country. But Faiki, after all of this, why do you believe so ANC members remain loyal to their party? I mean, some people say it's basically now just a criminal organization. Some people say it's ideology. Why do you think so many people remain loyal to the ANC? The, I think there are two main reasons. The, the older generation, I think it's, it's sentiment. It's a historic sentiment that, that forces them to continue to identify with the ANC. But largely, the modus operandi, especially under Zuma's, remember that he almost completed 10 years. He was in office for nine years. His modus operandi was to suck in everybody into corruption, then no, to, to make sure that nobody would speak out, just as, as he has threatened many times, he claims that he has files against people that he never actually discloses. But his modus operandi was to make sure that he, so many strategic leaders that hold office in the ANC 
participated in the process of robbing this country and our people. So once they, they know that they too are not so clean, it becomes difficult for them to stand up and, um, and challenge the ANC. There is a guy, I won't say his name, but he comes from the historic, one of the historic families that really all that boys, you know, held the, his, that family is held high in the ANC for historic reasons. From generation to generation to generation, there have been foreigners mm. in the ANC, in exile and, and underground movement, etc. That guy re resides in Cape Town. He contacted me after the launch of um, Action SA in 2020 and said, you know, Feiki, um, congratulations for forming a new party. We need a, a center party for South Africa, but for the sake of the history of my family, I'm not able to publicly endorse or support you or your party. Incredible. What I, what I can do is when voting comes, I will secretly vote for you because voting is secret, but um, publicly going out to show dismay against the corrupt ANC, I would be betraying my family history. So we had a bit of argument in a number of calls, um, but the, he was steadfast. And he is actually very well off. And I think he, he earned his, his, his wealth genuinely and legitimately, because I've never heard about, well, of course, probably from contracts of government, um, but whether they were given erroneously, I don't think so. Um, otherwise he wouldn't be wishing the ANC out of office. He wouldn't be promising to, to vote for them against them secretly. And I did not seek him. He, he, he sought my number and called me. So I think he was being sincere. He said he can't, he can't, um, betray the history of the family publicly. That's a fascinating. Uh, yeah, that explains so a lot. Uh, Faiki, do you know who JJ Debane is? Uh, the, the person who recently made the allegations that in the formation of COPE, there were ANC leaders involved like Trevor Manuel and Tito Mbaweni. What do you think of that story? Well, I do know JJ Debane. He's an anchor, a radio anchor and TV personality. Um, it does make sense because I, I went back to the history of Splinter's new parties um, when we formed um, Action SA. And I've seen a pattern of the ANC, ANC involvement. Either they organize a splinter. I wouldn't, I would not necessarily say that they organize a splinter. I don't know. I don't have facts to justify that. What I have seen as a pattern is that they organize splinters like the, the ATM. But then where the splinter group is not facilitated by them, they deploy people to kill that new organization from within. That I have factual knowledge of. And, and who does this deployment? Is it the Minister of State Security? Not, not the Minister of State Security alone. It, I would say the security cluster together with the Tuli House. That's interesting. So they, and it's, this is all done in some backlit room. Okay, COPE is afraid to us. We need to send some members in there to kill that party. Yes, and um, I'm just checking my fire because it's cold, my fire is dying, but it's fine. Um, you see, if you look at what happened against, or the, the, the genesis and the conclusion of the fees must fall, it's an interesting episode to study. And um, how it that it how it started, how it gained momentum, and all those things, and how suddenly it died, and how some of its leaders received lucrative positions 
thereafter. Same modus operandi. Wow, that's interesting. And during your period as a member of parliament for the ANC, did you ever, ever feel threatened by COPE? Did you feel, was, was there some angst within the ANC, okay, with the formation of COPE, we might lose our majority? Well, I'm one of the people that said it's the democratic right of people that joined COPE to go and join COPE. And I said that publicly. So I, I personally did not have pumps because I also knew at that stage that their frustration was with corruption, especially Terra Lakota, because Terra had, uh, had, has a history and he has served in many portfolios and you wouldn't find anything that suggests that he, he, he did any wrong. And at one stage, he was also Minister of Defense. And as a result, he also knew a lot about ANC corruption in the arm steel and sensitive areas. So um, there was a discussion once or twice that um, spoke about COPE, but uh, when they plan to infiltrate, it would not be in a big meeting like an NEC meeting where it would be, a, it would be in a kind of a, a COVID meeting and there were a number of COVID meetings. And uh, Faiki, so after you left the ANC, you joined the ACDP. Why did you only remain with the ACDP for such a short period before you joined Action ESO? My joining, uh, my joining ACDP was a protest action. And I said so when I joined ACDP. I had threatened for a while that I would leave the ANC if the ANC does not address corruption. I've, I threatened internally as well as publicly. And um, eventually when they did not listen, I looked at which party could I join. And just, just because I'm a, a staunch Christian and their policies, much as they are a one percenter or two percenter party, their policies are, their policies are based on, you know, they are kind of biblical, not really biblical, but they, they, they refer a lot to, if, if you are a Christian, you'll understand their policy that they are kind of God-centered. So I chose that party for that reason, but um, I was planning to immigrate after the Zondo Commission. We all had not um, anticipated that the Zondo Commission would take so long. Remember that um, uh, the public protector had suggested a very short period for, of investigation. And actually, right from the beginning, I discussed with him when I saw him here, I said, you know, public protector, um, this thing is runs very deep and it has got tentacles all over. And I said, you are, when I met him, he had eight months left in the office. I said, one, the ANC is deliberately starving your office of resources of money. They are not going to give you money to investigate this thing. Secondly, you are left with eight, eight, eight months in office. You are not going to do justice to this investigation. So um, you should actually suggest a proposed, a judicial commission of inquiry. So at that stage, he recommended a short one, but it extended and extended and extended for legitimate reasons. But sometimes I was also very, like every time they go, the, 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 the leader of uh, the, the chairperson of the commission goes to court to ask an extension because I was one of the, in fact, historically, I'm the, the only individual in a personal capacity that challenged Zuma as a head of state in court several times, more than three times to, to, to launch the Zondo Commission, the commission of inquiry. He, he stalled at every turn from the Houting High Court to the Constitutional Court to the Appeal Court. Of the seven parties that were opposing Zuma, all of them are not personality, they're not individual persons. Mm. They are NGOs and political parties, the DA, I think the EFF as well, I'm not sure about the EFF. So I'm the only singular human being in South Africa that ever 
took a head of state to court whilst belonging to the same party as the head of state. Because when I took Zuma to court, I was still an ANC member and a prominent one for that matter. So um, it was my intention that I would immigrate after the Zondo Commission have tabled its report because I knew I would be targeted. I knew that I'm not, I'm, I'm not finding employment anyway. I knew that my children will suffer for a st stance I took and all those things. But then because of the numerous extensions, I could not put into action my intentions up until the constitutional court ruled that individuals can stand for the legislature, uh, provincial legislature, as well as uh, parliament. Remember that you could only do um, as an independent candidate, you could only do that at local government level. So when the constitutional court ruled that way, that day when it announced the ruling, I wrote on my Facebook page and said, if I became an independent candidate for parliament, would you vote for me? And within a very short space of time, more than a thousand um, respondents said, join hands with Hemen Mashaba. Hemen Mashaba had been doing the people's dialogue up to that time when they pointed me to, to him. So immediately I wrote again, after I read the comments, I wrote again on my Facebook page, I said, could somebody forward me Hemen Mashaba's number? And within five minutes, I got that number. And within 10 minutes, I called him and he picked up the phone. And I told him what had just happened. And he gladly received me and told me he, had, you know, he respects me. And that is the historic way in which I began to, to work with him and became a member of Action SA. But I did not just jump into the bandwagon. I told him that currently I'm a member of the ACDP and I cannot just join another party without having a conversation with the ACDP leader. And the ACDP, ACDP leader and his wife and family had hosted me several times. We still have a very good relationship. So I started a negotiation, not a negotiation. I, I, I requested a meeting with Reverend Mishwe and I told Reverend Mishwe that Reverend, much as I'm a member of, of, of in fact, before I spoke to um, Reverend Mishwe, I said to Mr. Heman Mashaba, the, the, the opposition parties in South Africa are not serious about removing the ANC from power. I will work with you if you declare that your intention is to remove the ANC from power because I'm not willing to join any party for the sake of joining it. I was about to immigrate, but then are you really willing to, to challenge the power uh, to wrestle the power from the ANC? And he said, yes. And then we agreed that that is the route we take as action as in. So when I went to uh, Reverend Mishwe, we had about two or three meetings together and obviously he wouldn't want me go, to go. I said to him, unfortunately, even the DA is not having an intention or a capability to remove the ANC because it's actually very lucrative, you know, to be an opposition in parliament because um, the leader of opposition has certain perks, all of them. I think they are all treated like almost like a deputy president at that level. They have bodyguards and stuff like that. So the first meeting, Reverend Michel said, no, fake you go and think about it. And then we met again in two weeks time. And then I said, no, I'm standing on this one. He, he really wanted me to stay and he was very heartbroken together with uh, his wife when I left, eventually they decided that amicably, um, they cannot force me to stay when I have decided that I'm joining a party that is declaring openly that its mission is to remove the ANC from power. So that is my history with the ACDP. Mm. And thank you for clarifying that. Faki, but why do you think Kenneth Mashu doesn't want to declare that. Why do, why do you think he doesn't want to declare, I want to remove the ANC? He's not as devoted, perhaps, as Herman Mashaba. I think it's genuinely because he knows historically how his party has performed. You know, 
um, his party would always, from 1994, his party has performed not spectac spectacularly anyway. So I think he's being realistic when he, he, he doesn't declare that he has got, the party has got capacity and capability to, 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 to remove the ANC. With, the, with, with, the, with Action SA, the declaration, it's a, it's a declaration made at inception. Unlike that if, if the, 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 the uh, ACDP did that right now, it will be different, you know? People would, I, I mean, historically the question would be, why do you think you'll succeed now if you have not succeeded since 1994? But with, with Action SA as a new party, that is a momentum building rallying point for the party to, to remove the ANC from power, that declaration. So to be fair to the ACDP and uh, the, the, the Reverend Mission, I think it will be nonsensical if he claims that he, the party has got the capability to remove the ANC because the electorate results from 1994 show otherwise that Yes, he will continue gaining seats here and there, but he does not have the capability to, to remove the ANC. Not maybe unless he joined forces with other opposition parties. Okay, so Feige, you are now the chairperson of Action ESA in the Western Cape. What is your opinion of the DA's job in the Western Cape? You obviously probably feel that you can do a much better job than the Democratic Alliance is doing in the Western Cape. You know, only yesterday... If you go and check the media, Cape Town was declared the third most, I don't know, most important, something like that, city or whatever, most advanced or developed city in the world. And that is a view that is informed by looking at Cape Town with the eyes of the DA, where the, whereby the DA services largely the affluent and the privileged. If you go to, I also live in a very affluent area of Cape Town. So um, services are good here, but every Saturday and Sunday, sometimes I do recruitment on the ground with my team. We go to Kayalicha, we go to the colored areas, we go the, the sewage that is in the streets, the squalor, um, the degradation, the ruining of people's dignity. The other day we were at another hostel in, in Kayalicha. You know, every time you, you, you go and recruit in the township, you already wake up in the morning with a broken heart. And you have to, you, you know that you're going to see squalor, poverty, hunger, um, Young people drunk already by 11 o'clock. Young people sharing, I don't know what enhanced oka pipes and, and stuff like that. It's a painful situation. So there are two, like Becky used to say that there are two economies in South Africa. There are two realities in the Western Cape. There is a reality of the DA service to the affluent and um, the rich, then there is a level of poverty and people not serviced, and they are more than the first group that the DA does nothing about. And that is the, the people whose hope and dignity we want to restore as Action SA. But it doesn't mean that we don't want to service the affluent. You can do both. We can do both, of course. And if you look, for instance, at my team, it's a thoroughly mixed team. And um, that's how we, we, we define ourselves. Uh, is the, it's, it's, it's diverse in every respect in terms of people of affluence and people that are not affluence, a representation of demographics as they stand in the Western Cape. So it's a, it's, it's a continued effort. And that's why we, went to, we want to establish in the Western Cape. And service to the poor, mm. and but continued service to the rich, 
but begin service to the poor. That is so sorely lacking. So, so you believe, like Herman Mashaba believes, that the DA is to focus sort of on grass cutting for the affluent instead of fighting for the poor. That's true. I have lived that in the Western Cape. I've lived it. I see it every day. It's very true. And what do you think of the DA's position of federalizing power to send the power of the railways, policing to a provincial level to the Western Cape? That's nonsensical because uh, the, our constitution does not espouse a federal state. The, the, that constitution will have to change first before that can happen. So you wouldn't be in favor of changing the constitution to allow that to happen or... No, no, no. I'm saying currently, as we speak, the constitution does not allow that. For, for anybody to do that successfully, the constitution will, be, will have to be changed first. Now, with the majority of the ANC currently in parliament, do you think that you'll be able to enforce that? No, it's the ANC is not going to allow that. Hence, um, we need a coalition government for 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 2024, if there is no um, straight winner amongst all the parties, excluding the ANC, to, to, to do these things, to go through the constitution, to go through the laws, that this enabling parts to be revisited, whether they are in the law or in the constitution and the practices. And then, you know, the law has got the letter and the spirit. So we will revisit the letter of the law as well as the spirit of the law to make sure that, and it's not going to be an easy project because coalition are by nature very difficult, but um, we, we, we owe it to South Africa to usher in a different set of state management that excludes the, the ANC. Okay, just to be clear, okay, so let's say in a hypothetical situation, the action, action essay gets a supermajority. Would you want to change the constitution to allow more powers to the state, or is that even so, is something you don't want to consider? The it's provinces, very, very me. dangerous to allow more power to the state. Power should belong to the people. Yeah, excuse me, if I, to the provinces. I, I made a mistake there. To, so to send more powers to, for example, the Western Cape to control their own transportation, policing, that sort of thing. You know, uh, I'm going to give you a personal view instead of an action as a view. Remember, we are a new party and we are evolving in terms of policy also. Um, I personally think these provinces are a waste of money the nine legislatures, because in the nine legislatures, you have perks for the premiers, the nine premiers, you have perks, each, each uh, provincial cabinet is having about 10 people, all receiving very, very high perks. Each one has got an administration and an HOD and all those things. I think it's an unnecessary and we have not really seen the benefit of administration by provinces. So in my view, we will have to review the provinces. I'm not, I don't know whether we will review them to scrap them totally or whether we will come with another mechanism. And this is my personal view. And I've always held it even when I was in the ANC and I've always articulated it. But the uh, Action SA will soon be going into a, a policy drive where we will call on all people, whether they are our members or not our members, the thing will form various think tanks for policy participation. So um, I cannot predict the outcome of that process. All I can tell you is my personal view in this matter. That's very interesting because Michael Beamont, the chairperson of Action SAS, mentioned something similar in terms of he doesn't see, really see a point of provincial government. He's, his vision is of a, of a South Africa where those powers are mainly devolved to a municipal level, that you only have municipal governments and the national government, and that is to get rid of the federal governments. There's, there's not really a point of it, uh, the, the provincial governments, excuse me. It, it makes sense. It's logical. 
and we have not caucus with Michael and I don't I didn't even know that Michael also um, espoused the same thinking. Hence, I declared that it is my individual thinking. So it really makes sense. It's, it's, it's wasteful. The provinces are, there is, it's so wasteful. And even the, the Zondo Commission did not even dig deeper, the, the terms of reference, did not even dig deeper into corruption at the level of the provinces. It provis and should we do that, we are even going to be more shocked, more shocked that, than we were shocked by the national state corruption and state capture. So, Faiki, I know in the Western Cape, there's this movement, this growing movement for Cape independence, Cape secession. They recently had an independence march and they say, I mean, South Africa is going down a hill. We should just break away. What is your opinion of this movement? I don't support breaking away from South Africa. Simple. And and you, if you were the premier of the Western Cape, would you allow referendum on this issue, or wouldn't you even allow a referendum for the, the people of the Western Cape to decide on this issue? I will declare my my ignorance here. I I don't know if um, a provincial government can do a referendum like that. I'm, 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 I might be naive. They can. I think such a matter belongs to national decision. It, uh, it belongs to all South Africans to decide whether any province can annex itself from the totality of South Africa. I don't think that decision should be taken provincially at the level of province. So if I become a premier, which I don't want to become actually, I would rather prefer to go back to national parliament. But um, I, I'm not at the deciding factor. The party will decide whether I go or whether I don't go and all those things. Um, I would facilitate people's participation and I would listen carefully and attentively to people's aspirations. And where the aspirations are unrealistic, where they need constitutional review or where they need um, national government, I would humbly submit it to the people and not promise them a pie in the sky when I fully know that it's not possible to do that, to do certain things until certain things happen, like changing the constitution. Uh, often leaders are afraid or unpop to become unpopular, you know, to, to, to just because there is a demand or there is a movement that appears to be gaining ground, uh, now, if you are to speak reasonability to them, you, you put your head like an ostrich in the sand as a leader. You don't tell them that actually go and revisit this and that and that and see if your demand is possible within this framework. I don't think it's possible. So I would be honest with them, but I would encourage and facilitate participation, especially civil society uh, participation. Oh, yeah, that's a perfectly valid and fair point. And Faike, I want to thank you so much for the time. I know you have a busy schedule. Thank you so much for making time for us. I want to give you one last opportunity if you want to add, plug, or say anything you want to to our viewers. Um, what I want to say is that our performance in Ward 96 of Pretoria West, where um, the DA is strongly entrenched, where we got 29%, we would have loved to win. We didn't win because in certain pockets, uh, the, the DA is deeply entrenched. And for us, it's a, for me, as a leader of the Western Cape, it is a lesson to, to, to learn from. It, it means more hard work, more hard work, deeper organic structures. Uh, uh, so for me, it's a, it's a learning curve. I was watching that, um, with interest, how it will perform, because it is instructive to the Western Cape to, to challenge the, the power of the DA. But in conclusion, much as we did not con contest here, we targeted to, 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 to lobby in ANC strongholds and in areas where the DA performed like marginally, marginally like 50% or so. And even without contesting, we managed to bring both the ANC and the DA 
down in terms of electoral vote, uh, ele electoral vote. But we should not sit on our laurels. There is hard work to be done as the outcome of what 96 in Pretoria has shown. Well, thank you, Faiki. Thank you so much for your time. This has been such an interesting discussion. To our viewers, you most certainly enjoyed it. Please consider liking this video, sharing it as widely as possible, and subscribing to our channel. My name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview.